for having us here. Um, as one of our actors described our work, this is not your grandma's Shakespeare. Another even called it Shakespeare on crack. <laughs> but the reality is that over 400 years, researchers have investigated almost every conceivable person as a possible author of Shakespeare's plays, including one who did not even exist, except as a spelling mistake. And in all those years, there was just one person who happened to get overlooked. And I cannot help thinking that the reason she was overlooked was because of her skin color and because she was Jewish. It was literally unthinkable to white male Shakespeare scholars that a dark-skinned Jewish woman poet could have written these plays even though she was the first woman in the country to publish a book of original poetry. She came from a theatrical family deeply involved in the company that performed the plays and even though she was actually mistress for 10 years to the man in charge of the English theater. In retrospect, we can see that she was in fact the most obvious candidate. But for hundreds of years, gender and ethnicity and religion have blinkered everyone so much that they literally could not see her. She became invisible. And if you've looked at our website for the Dark Lady Players, you will know that her name is Amelia Bassano Lanier, the so-called Dark Lady of the Sonnets. And she gives her name to our theatre company, the Dark Lady Players. And my 5,000 word article on her, which is the first article to um, launch a new authorship candidate in a peer-reviewed journal, appears this month in the Oxfordian, the Journal of, Oxford, of Shakespearean Authorship Studies. And if you go to our website, www.darkladyplayers.com, you can get an advanced copy. So for the rest of this talk, I want to tell you a little about Amelia's life and how she's a perfect match for the area's rare knowledge in the plays, some of which Jenny talked about. And I'll finish up by talking about how the discovery of her as the author transforms the way that the play can be performed, which is what you're all concerned about as actors. So Amelia was born in 1569, five years after Mr. Shakespeare, and her family were hidden Jews, known as Moranos or Conversos, who had come over from Venice to London in the 1530s to be the court recorder troop for King Henry VIII. And their police records describe them as being black, which may just reflect a, a dark Sephardic appearance or may reflect their original Moroccan ancestry. And we know that they spoke Italian at home because we have records of them cursing the police in that language, as well as their letters to the queen in Italian. And some members of the household had even been imprisoned as Moranos. They lived almost immediately opposite the theater district and they were responsible for playing stage music at court. But Amelia's family also accounted for half of the musicians who played for the company, known later as the King's Men, that had the monopoly on performing the Shakespearean plays. Funnily enough, um, of the surviving music for the Shakespearean plays, most of it was written by her first cousin, the lutist Robert Johnson, including famous tunes like Where the Bee Sucks, There Suck I, and Full Fathom Five, Thy Father Lieth. So her family were intimately and deeply involved with the production processes for the Shakespearean plays. She was a major poet. She was mistress of the man in charge of the English theater. For God's sake, somebody at least notice her. And at the age of seven, she was given to be educated in the Willoughby family, who lived down the road from, from, from the theaters in Willoughby House, where the, the Barbican is today. The matriarch of the family was well known as an early Tudor proto-feminist, who was part of a women's Bible study group at court, she read the Bible in multiple translations and encouraged all women to read the Bible for themselves. In fact, she was the person who persuaded Henry VIII to allow women to read the Bible for themselves. And her son, Lord Willoughby, was one of England's leading generals, as well as being the ambassador to Denmark, and a personal friend of Tycho Brahe, who was astro astronomy as used in Hamlet. And her daughter, Susan Bertie, was the Dowager Duchess of Kent, and she was the person who educated Amelia from the age of seven. And at the age of 13, Amelia became mistress to Lord Hunsdon, the son of Mary Boleyn and Queen Elizabeth's cousin, if not her half-brother. And Amelia lived with him in his princely palace in the Strand for the next 10 years. And not only was he Lord Chamberlain, the man in charge of the English theater, as well as the patron of the company that performed the Shakespearean plays, he also had a garden of rare plants, was the royal falconer, was the general in charge of England, and had three judgeships. So I hope from this little tiny taste, you're beginning to see how Amelia's biography, unlike that of Mr. Shakespeare, has an exact fit 
with the knowledge of Italian and Venice, the knowledge of Judaism, the very unusual knowledge of music, the knowledge of Denmark, the rare plants, the law, the generalship, the court, the Kentish flower names, the astronomy and biblical translation, and so on. And not to mention of the playwright's references to menstruation, abortion recipes, sewing, pastry making, and literature written for young women. I don't think Marlowe or Green wrote about menstruation in their plays. 